Hey everyone, welcome back to Microwave Engineering. I'm your instructor, Dr. James Nagel, and today I would like to talk to you about the Smith chart. So what is the Smith chart really? To answer that, uh, I think it makes sense to think of it in terms of a short answer versus the long answer. So the short answer is essentially just a polar plot of a voltage reflection coefficient. So you imagine a transmission line is exciting some load and there is a reflection off of that load. And all we're going to all we're going to do is plot the reflection coefficient somewhere on the complex plane. Right? And everything else on the Smith chart is just bells and whistles on top of that. The long answer, however, is that transmission lines are very complicated. The theory of transmission lines is a complex subject. And we human beings are very visual creatures. Okay, so it's easy to get lost in all of the complex mathematics of transmission line theory. So you've seen for the last several lectures, we've just done derivation after derivation after derivation. And some of the equations are pretty simple and elegant. And some equations are just horrible monstrosities, right? So if only there was some way to take all of that information, all of those patterns, and express it in some kind of geometric pattern, then it would be much more, I guess, palatable for our brains to digest. So in that sense, you can think of the Smith chart as a way of taking all of that complicated mathematics and creating a sort of visual metaphor out of it that follows geometric patterns, which then allows us to kind of visualize the mathematical structure underneath. So with that picture in mind, let's discuss some of the just the basic properties of the Smith chart. So first things first, all points within the Smith chart necessarily land within a circle of unit radius. And you'll notice that that's basically an expression of conservation of energy um, for, for any passive load, right? Some load consisting of resistors and capacitors and inductors. I cannot create energy. I will either, I can only dissipate some energy in my load and then reflect the rest of it back, but I can never reflect more energy than what I excite the load with which means all of the, the allowed values for my reflection coefficient have to fall within this unit circle. Now, hypothetically, you could imagine an active load, which might be like an amplifier uh, detecting the signal and then amplifying it and shooting it back down the line again, in which case I could have a dot somewhere outside of that unit circle. Uh, but generally, that doesn't happen a whole lot in real life. But that's what it would represent if it did. Now consider some of the, the common reference loads, right? So you have the short circuit, the matched load, and the open circuit. So obviously the, the open circuit, the, the reflection coefficient evaluates exactly to a real value of plus one. So that would be a dot on the far right end of the Smith chart here, the open circuit. And of course the opposite scenario of a short circuit would be a reflection coefficient of negative one, which would be on the left edge of the circle. And then there's the in-between case of a perfectly matched load where there is no reflection, so gamma is zero, and it lands right there on the middle of my Smith chart. So if you take that idea and extend it out a little bit, any real resistance between zero and infinity has to necessarily land somewhere on that real axis or the x-axis, right? It is only with a reactive load that we get values with some imaginary component. Uh, you also notice it's not exactly a linear relationship, right? I have zero on the left and infinity on the right. So there, there's this infinite squishing of points the closer and closer you get uh, to the right. That is to say, uh, the, for each differential change in my real resistance, my motion to the right of the circle, it's less and less and less, okay? So that, that just kind of think of those, all those values <laughs> of my real resistance squished into this line segment from negative one to plus one, representing infinite possible load resistances there. Now let's take another scenario we talked about in one of our previous lectures, and that is a load with some fixed line length away from it. So what does that do to my reflection coefficient? And we already talked about this, we did the derivation, and all that happens is it adds a phase shift to my reflection coefficient. In particular, it's a two times the electrical length. That's because this, the wave has to go down to strike the load and then come back again. So it traverses that length L twice. So 
in terms of the Smith chart, you can just imagine this little phase shift being added to my complex value, which simply corresponds to a rotation in the complex plane in the clockwise direction uh, with, a, with an angular rotation of exactly two times beta L. So you see, we, we can already uh, imagine this sort of graphical representation of this relatively complicated interaction between a transmission line and its load, the behavior visually is just a simple rotation of that dot. So that's all well and good so far, but some of the real magic for a transmission line doesn't really become apparent until you start thinking about real and reactive loads uh, coming together. So one of the first things we're gonna do is talk about this notion of a normalized impedance. So. Remember that the reflection coefficient we derived follows this nice simple equation, ZL minus Z0 over ZL plus Z0. However, in a more broad abstract sense, we don't necessarily want to tie ourselves down to any particular value of the characteristic impedance. Right? It's only kind of by happenstance that we really like to use 50 ohms, but we could hypothetically use 75 ohms or 100 ohms or 1000 ohms for our characteristic impedance and we want to think about our transmission lines in a more generic sense rather than any sort of particulars. So with that in mind, it helps to define the normalized impedance, which is little zl, which is simply the load impedance divided by the characteristic impedance. And now you get an expression for the reflection coefficient that is totally independent of any actual characteristic impedance. And it's just a, a function of the ratio between the load and the impedance, but not the act, any actual particular values. So with that in mind, there are two very common problems that we encounter very frequently in transmission line theory. The first problem you can think of as the forward problem, and that says, given some load impedance, calculate the reflection coefficient. And we've done this a lot, and it follows a very simple expression here. And you get a complex value for our reflection coefficient given some normalized load impedance. Alternatively, it's very common to encounter the opposite problem, which says given the reflection coefficient, what is the load impedance that would give rise to such a reflection? So you do a little bit of algebra and you see that ZL is one plus gamma over one minus gamma. And it too also has this uh, real and imaginary component to it. So these are two problems. You can think of forward problem and an inverse problem. And we wanna think about this in a more visual sense rather than a sort of abstract mathematical or algebraic sense. So with that in mind, uh, let's do a little bit of some mathematical arrangements here. Uh, so first things first, what we're going to do is separate out the real and the imaginary components between the normalized impedance and the reflection coefficient. So you notice on the left, we just have ZL, the little ZL was broken up into an RL and a JXL. So that's the, the real resistance or normalized resistance plus an imaginary reactance or normalized reactance. And likewise, on the right, our reflection coefficient was separated into real and imaginary bits, which all I did was separate. The next step is a little tedious, um, but you just separate out the real and the imaginary values here, right? And, and th that is a bit of an algebraic, um, a, a tedious algebraic <laughs> derivation. But what you get are two simple expressions where RL is some function of my real and imaginary gamma, and my XL is also some other function of my real and imaginary gamma. So if you do the algebra, you get these two expressions shown here. Now, these are not really interesting, or they're kind of interesting per se. You, know, you can plug this into MATLAB or computer program and crunch on this stuff. But we want to get out of that space of thinking about these things in terms of algebra and computers and more in a visual representation. So what we do now is we're going to rearrange our terms. And what happens if you're very clever, you can get these two expressions. And you notice there's a, a you have three, uh, uh, I guess you say there's four terms. There's the real and the imaginary bits of gamma. And then there's the real, react, real resistance and then the uh, imaginary reactants. But we've separated them. So I have an expression on top that is all in terms of gamma and my R sub L. And the expression on the bottom is all in terms of gamma and X sub L. So the question now is, why did we go through all that trouble? And we kind of skipped a lot of algebra here, but 
there's a very interesting result that happens when you go through this derivation. And that is you find that these equations represent circles. So the first equation you'll notice represents a family of circles. Uh, that is to say, given some fixed value of r sub l, there is a family of possible values for gamma sub r and gamma sub i. So a, an infinite span of possible values that will satisfy this thing. And they all lie on a circle. So each value of r l will then specify a unique circle. So, okay, you know, and that's interesting and all. And I've shown them here on the right, the, these circles here. So for very small values of RL, I get very, very large circles and they approach the unit circle as RL equals zero. And you notice they're all shifted over the right where the right edge of the circle touches the right edge of the Smith chart there. And as my real impedance goes to infinity, my radius on these circles go to zero, and in fact, they shrink into little points on the far right edge of the Smith chart, which again should make sense because an infinite real impedance implies an open circuit. So they all necessarily have to converge on that little point on the right. And you also notice there's no Y offset. There's only this sort of shifting F X offset, uh, but they're all shifting in such a way that they still maintain that little touch on the right edge of the circle. Next, I'm going to look at the, the second equation that we derived. And again, you get a weird family of circles. And you notice there's kind of like these positive circles going up and these negative circles going down. And those correspond to real or, or sorry, positive or negative values of my reactants. So again, you have this idea of given some fixed reactants, what are all the possible values of gamma that would satisfy that particular reactants? And they all lie on a circle. So a different reactants corresponds to a different circle. And as the reactants approaches infinity, which is again an open circuit, they again have to converge on that point on the far right edge of the Smith chart. So you notice that that far right point on, on the Smith chart is very special because it corresponds to an open circuit. And also as my reactance goes to zero, then the radius of that circle approaches infinity, which then corresponds essentially to just the X axis, which is kind of neat there. But you also notice they're all shifted over by a value of one. So let's put that together now. So each circle, remember, corresponded to a family of possible solutions to either a fixed real value of the impedance or a fixed imaginary value. Uh, so if I impose two, simul uh, two conditions simultaneously, you essentially have a simultaneous system of equations that have to be solved together. And there's one and only one value that will correspond to that, and that's the intersection of these circles. So if I impose a real load impedance and a real imaginary impedance, at the same time, there is now one point that satisfies both of those conditions simultaneously which means I can now convert back and forth between a reflection coefficient gamma or my load impedance ZL. So this is why when you look at a Smith chart, you'll see a bunch of these circles overlapping each other. And each one is a direct conversion to the reflection coefficient or each reflection coefficient will convert directly to a solution to these intersecting circles, thereby telling me a normalized load impedance. So, okay, that's great and all, but what is, what, well, how is that useful? How do I get some intuition out of this? So I wanna give you a simple thought experiment. And that is imagine, say, a, a 50 ohm line uh, exciting a 50 ohm load. And in series with that real resistive load, I've placed an inductor. So let's start by imagining the inductance is zero which corresponds to no reactance, and the inductor is basically a short circuit. So in that sense, the, the, the transmission line is matched to the load, and my reflection coefficient is zero, and I would plot it as a simple dot right there at the origin. But suppose, hypothetically, I just start dialing up the, the inductance. So you imagine like a little dial that goes from zero to infinity <laughs> on that L term, what happens? How, what path do those, those points follow? So, well, so immediately you think as L goes to infinity, that will then immediately behave as an open circuit, which means the final value at L equals infinity will correspond to the far right edge of the Smith chart, 
and there is some arc or path that my my gamma will follow from A to B, right? From the match load to the infinite load. And that path is simply the circle, the positive half of the circle. So that's one way to kind of interpret these reactive circles here. So I imagine a fixed R sub L and I can dial my inductance along and it will follow this little arc along that circle. So for that reason, you can now imagine all these possible values of my reactants and they will be intersections along that point as well and they're labeled on the Smith chart. So for that reason, all points on the positive half or the, the top half of the Smith chart are called inductive reactive, right? So that re inductor in series with the resistor can only give me values on the top half of that plane. So any real resistor will just correspond to some different circle, but any positive inductance there or positive reactance implies above the x-axis. So with that little thought experiment in mind, let's do the opposite. Let's replace the inductor with a capacitor. Only instead of starting at zero, we're gonna start at infinity, right? So imagine an infinite capacitor, which is a short circuit, right? Because the reactance is negative J over omega C. So infinite C means zero reactants. The X sub L goes to zero. So then again, you start right there at the, the, the origin. And now I'm going to dial my capacitance the opposite direction. So starting at infinity and I'm gonna dial it all the way down to zero. So again, as the capacitance approaches zero, we have the opposite situation. Zero capacitance implies an open circuit. So that dot will somehow have to meander its way to the far right edge of the Smith chart or that unit circle to correspond with that open circuit. And then there'll be this nice infinite continuum of values in between. So if you then plot that, you see exactly this circle here or this family of circles intersecting on the circle to give you that little trajectory starting at the origin and going all the way to the open circuit at the far right of the Smith chart there. Okay, so that is a nice sort of visual metaphor for what's going on with a real and reactive load. And for this reason, all the points in the bottom half of the Smith chart, so all the negative imaginary components are called capacitive reactants. So you have inductive reactants on top and capacitive reactants on the bottom. So in conclusion, what does this all mean? So the first thing the Smith chart does is it allows you to very quickly convert back and forth between gamma and Z sub L, my normalized impedance. Because they're all, all those circles are marked with the real and the imaginary value of ZL. And it's very easy to uh, unpack a magnitude and a phase off the reflection coefficient, thereby giving you a quick back and forth between the two without necessarily appealing to any computers or algebra. Some other fun things you learn is what type of load does a gamma correspond to? Is it sort of acting like a capacitor or is it acting more like an inductor? So you learn that just by the which half of the circle your your gamma lies in. Those sorts of fun bits of information now are should be feeling intuitive, right? And you also start seeing these interesting patterns in the sense of how does gamma move around as I toy with the parameters in my system. So we just looked at a couple of special little cases, but there's a lot more we could have done. For example, I could have fixed my inductor and then just added more resistance, and I would then follow along the reactive circle rather than, say, one of the uh, resistive circles. Uh, you could also imagine a system that's totally fixed, but what I'm changing is the frequency of excitation. So how do you think that might affect the motion of gamma around the chart? All right, so those are some of the fun things uh, that the Smith chart makes easy once you get the hang of it. But just remember that the whole point is to take a bunch of this sort of highly mathematical stuff and turn it into a nice visual abstraction that follows simple geometric rules.